Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. Since 2009, HRN podcasts have been exploring the wide world of food, beverage, and agriculture. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Diageo Bar Academy. Learn more at diageobaracademy.com. That's D-I-A-G-E-O baracademy.com. So you don't shun the devil with your rock and roll, Lord. Knows that country music's gonna save your soul. The devil runs his groove in them rhythm and blues that sound. It's gonna get you sound in the end. Welcome back to the Speakeasy. I'm Souther Teague. And I'm Greg Benson. Hey, Greg. Just the two of us today. What's up? Just the two of us today. Ah, oh, we're hanging out here and you don't sound so good, buddy. What's What's up with that? I do sound like, um, I don't know, a bullfrog fell asleep in my throat. Um, <laughs> I'm at Portland Cocktail Week. I'm in Portland, uh, Oregon, uh, at Portland Cocktail Week. And I've been, well, frankly, I've been doing a bunch of drinking. Uh, and so also, you know, it, that means it's quite early for me. It's 9 a.m. here uh, while we're doing the show. And uh, I had an event last night, um, and I um, I imbibed. I definitely had some drinks. <laughs> it was fun, though. We did uh, kind of a get uh, get the band back together situation. Chris Elford came up from uh, Seattle, as well as Lindsay Madison, both alum from Memoria Margo, uh, and myself, of course, got behind the bar and served some drinks. Uh, uh, we did a, an event with Jägermeister at a place called the White Owl. Huge, huge bar. But I think, you know, anytime I leave New York, I'm like, man, bars are huge. Um, yeah. So we're in this huge space serving. Amori Margo style cocktails with Jägermeister, uh, and it was a fun, fun time. Portland Cocktail Week is one of my favorite uh, cocktail um, events each year, and you know we haven't had it in the past two years due to, well, you know, gestures broadly. Um, <laughs> due to there we go, that's it. Uh, and uh, it was it's great to be back here, even though it's just a whirlwind for me. I've just popped in for this. I arrived uh, just after midnight on Tuesday night. Um, and then as soon as we're done with this show, I'll be flying out of here and it's only 9am on Thursday. Um, so it just, I just came in to do this one event, but I've gotten to see so many people. It's been great and super exciting and, uh, I'm exhausted. And that's, that's what's, that's, what's cool about this industry, man. That's what I like about it. And first of all, I feel like anytime you leave, not just New York, I feel like anytime you leave your specific bar, you look around, you're like, Oh my God, look at all this space. Yeah, like, I mean, uh, fifteen course, seats at a bar. What is this? Like, the, does the does the King of England drink here? But, <laughs> but uh, you know, I I I I really enjoy, and I've always enjoyed that. Like, if you're if you're steeped in this industry, or even if you like just pass through it for a little while, you're only ever really one degree of separation away from everybody else that's done this. You know, and it's and it's really cool that those connections really, you know. Last, I mean, later on today, I'm I'm traveling again, and I'm going to go and see Is someone I met. Going to a wedding? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but well, I'm going to I'm going to see my buddy who I was his best man after meeting him working at a bar in 2013. Mm-hmm. So you know, it's 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 cool how these connections can you know grow and mature and and thrive in an industry that really you know. You don't you don't go into this if you don't like people, and it's nice to have that you know you always can go home again vibe. Yeah, and I think uh, your your analogy of being one degree of separation away from everyone is I think pretty apt. Uh, you know, um, I think the cocktail, you know, craft cocktail, whatever we want to call our section of the of the field, um, is 
pretty freaking small numbers wise. Uh, and so, you know, we, we're all just, we know each other and I love it. Uh, that's what I love. And so, you know, things like uh, any of these cocktail conferences, including Portland Cocktail Week, it's like a reunion. You get to see faces you haven't seen in a while, especially again, after the pandemic or during the pandemic, wherever, wherever we are in this situation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm just roaming around and even walking on the streets of Portland as I'm going from one thing to another, or even just wherever I went for lunch or dinner, you know, people are like, Hey man, good to see you. And it's, I don't know, it's very energizing for me. Um, I feel, you know, uh, I haven't gotten to do a lot of traveling. I haven't gotten to do a lot of the things that I mostly enjoy doing. I've been just focusing on building our business. Uh, and it's really nice to reconnect people. It's very energizing. I'm, um, I don't want to say I'm stoked to go back to work, but I'm, I'm you know, <laughs> excited to get back to New York and, you know, knuckle in and keep going, you know? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's nice to be in a place where, like, I'm as excited as I will ever be to go back to work. Yeah. And, and then I would say, you know, even today's show, um, you know, the guests we had scheduled canceled on us at last minute. And so I, I, I grabbed a couple of people to be on the show with us uh, um, and I'm stoked to have them on with us. So who we got in the studio with us? Uh, well, speaking of Portland, in the studio with us today, we have Brett Adams and Jacob Greer, who are the authors of the upcoming book, Raising the Bar, a bottle by bottle guide to mixing masterful cocktails at home. Uh, oddly, oddly timely and oddly topical, guys. Welcome. Good to have you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks for having us on. Yeah. yeah so I, I, I want to ask you about you when you were pitching this book. Um, could you see the future? And if so, <laughs> why didn't you tell us? Because that seems like kind of a dick move. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I really wish we had timed this a little bit better. Um, Everybody who's we tell about this book, they think, oh, this is the perfect uh, pandemic book. You must have been inspired to write this during the pandemic. And that's not true at all. We actually, you know, Brett and I started meeting about this uh, back in like late 2019. And by the end of the year, we had a fully developed proposal that was going out. Um, you know, the downside is, you know, we'd actually sort of had this idea years before, but I was finishing another book first. And if I'd only known... I would have put that one down and done this one first so we could have had it out during 2020 because it would have been the perfect time for sales. What, what do you think makes it perfect for, for the pandemic? I mean, it's set up exactly to walk people through uh, making cocktails at home and kind of building mm. out their home bar. And that's exactly what everybody was trying to do when all the bars closed. Uh, so, yeah, unfortunately, it wasn't uh, that perfect timing, but I'm not too worried about it. I think it's a, it's an evergreen idea. There's always going to be somebody who wants to start making drinks at home, and uh, this book will be perfect for that. Yeah, and, and honestly, that's how I got into this whole thing in, in the first place. You know, I was working in uh, breweries and discovered I was terrible at making beer, and I was kind of trying to, you know, figure out where I wanted to go next, and I picked up a, a fairly well-known uh, cocktail book. Let's just say it rhymes with Eth and Company. And, <laughs> you know, learned to basically make cocktails from that. And I think that's how a lot of people, even a lot of professionals that I've met, have kind of gotten into this side of the bar game. But yours is structured in a slightly different way for the aspiring home bartender. So tell us kind of how, how the book reads and also how you got the idea to even write a book that way in the first place. I think we came from uh, that same idea of like we were looking at other books in the market when we were uh, learning how to make cocktails. We both taught ourselves how to bartend uh, at home and uh, you know we got really great cocktail books on the market, but sometimes they're made by professional bars and they showcase more what a professional bar can do and you can learn a ton from that, but sometimes it's a little hard to make all those drinks at home. And then the other side of it was... Uh, you see a lot of cocktail books that are really, really simple. But what happens if you are an aspiring bartender and you want more than, you know, five bottles at home or something like that? Um, there wasn't really something in the middle. Um, and, you know, I have I was a very poor person when I started bartending and I didn't have the money to go out and buy 15 bottles at once. And so I think we wanted to set a book up for people who had good ambitions to really learn a lot about spirits um, but didn't necessarily want to drop, you know, a thousand dollars at the liquor store day one. So the way our our book works is we give people a very basic pantry of syrups, bitters, and juices, and then every chapter is a new bottle you add to your bar. Um, and we only give you recipes that call for that new bottle and anything else we've called for previously in the book. So you never have to buy more than one bottle at a time. I love that. I love I love the evolution of it, and I love the acknowledgement of something that I've been saying for a while, which is that. By the time you're at a place in your career where you can write 
a cocktail menu, you are the least qualified person on earth to say what is, you know, everyday relatable information for the guest. You know, it's, it's, you, you do lose a bit of perspective on what people generally know and what is jargon. And I love kind of going back to that, you know, everyone, there are so many books out there that have a back to basics approach, but I like this sort of stepped program that you have in yours and kind of, you know, building the bar gradually so that that information of your audience rises as they get further and further along and as their bar gets, you know, more and more expensive to stock. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you end up with 25 bottles in your home bar and it's it's back to basics at the start, but uh, you very quickly, I think, cover those bases and get to progress. And I think it's fun to have a book where you can start wherever you are at and then see actual progression and knowledge and just cover all those all those basics. Yeah, and, and the other thing we wanted to to deal with, you know, which can be frustrating as someone who who got into bartending at home and read cocktail books and I see a recipe that looks interesting. And so I have to go out and buy some bottle and I do it and like the cocktail's good. I like this cocktail. But now I've got this ingredient that I use a quarter ounce at a time and only one drink to make it with. So like doing the math on that, I have to make this cocktail a hundred times if I'm ever gonna get through this bottle. And so it ends up sitting there. And so we also, you know, made ourselves the rule that any bottle that we tell you to buy. We're going to give you a bunch of cocktails to make it with. And, you know, even things that would normally be used in small amounts like Benedictine, we put in a couple cocktails where Benedictine is really the star of the show. You use an entire ounce of it, which you, you just don't see that often. Uh, so we really want people to actually use the bottles that we tell them to get to. And, and that was a fun challenge in, in laying out the book. I remember, I remember, um, <laughs> Early on in my career with with said very large cocktail uh, bartending book, I was making a drink and was very, very pleased with it. And I looked at the book and said, man, this book is the best, like $36 I ever spent. And I remember my roommate at the time sort of wryly cast his eyes over my ballooning home bar and just goes, oh, it's cost you a lot more than that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah, so so talk to me a little bit about how um, the the two of you got into into uh, you know writing books together in the first place, and how the give me give me the origin story of this duo that you two have here. Well, I think if I remember correctly, like Brett and I briefly overlapped at the Malt Lima Whiskey Library. We're like, wasn't it at the time my last? It's night something your first. <laughs> it was like your your last like, week was yeah. my first week. Um, <laughs> yeah, but but we immediately hit it off. Like we. We met and we're like, oh, we have a very similar way of thinking about drinks, very similar palettes. Uh, so we stayed in touch. Uh, I've been back and forth from the library since then, as has Brett. We actually both left and came back. I can't stay away um, from that place. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. keep drawing us back in. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've got uh, you know more writing background. I've, I've done one previous cocktail book uh, on beer cocktails. Um, and yeah, I remember working on uh, my previous book, uh, and my go-to workspace was actually the hotel lobby of the hotel bar where uh, Brett was working at the time. And we started hashing out this book and just realized it would be a fun partnership that we had similar ways of thinking and similar palettes. Uh, and yeah, Brett, Brett just proposed like, hey, why don't we do this together? And so as soon as I uh, finished my last book, which uh, did not, uh, was much more niche, it was about tobacco. <laughs> Um, we decided to take on this one and you know, write a book that might actually sell well, <laughs> yeah. uh, which, is, which is which is our goal here. Uh, hopefully we'll make one that's like broadly appealing and useful to people. And I'm really passionate about actually teaching people about cocktails. I think the, you know, we were talking a little bit off mic uh, before the podcast about, you know, whiskey companies that obscure information. And I'm, I just hate that. Like, I really like it when people know how to do stuff because I'm so appreciative of people that shared information when I was learning how to cook or learning how to make cocktails. And uh, now that I feel like I know something to share, like the first thing I want to do is share it and teach people uh, how to get to a where I'm at or hopefully further. Right. Um, and yeah, so, yeah, I'm totally into that. That's, uh, that's, you know, part and parcel of the reason that I love going to and being part of conferences like, you know, like Portland cocktail week and tales of the cocktail and, you know, even when I went exactly. to a, a barometer in, in Kiev and, you know, I think you're at some point somewhat, you know, bound to the notion that you have to share the information that you have so the people around you can can elevate their careers as well. You can't just, you know, be some sort of, you know, locked gatekeeper kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm a, I see people every day, you know, the whiskey library is 
uh, we, we joke about we can't, you know, stop coming back to it, but it's such a fun place to bartend because it's one of the few rooms where people show up uh, willing to learn and they want to learn. Um, it's a, uh, it's a pretty intimidating bar. There's, you know, over 2000 bottles. Um, and it just kind of sets the scene for guests being like, well, what can you teach me? And so we had a lot of practice interacting with people every single night, uh, who wanted to learn what whiskey was, why Manhattan tasted the way it was and how do you make a riff on a Manhattan. And so we just had a lot of practice talking to people about just the basics of cocktails and realizing that, uh, it was, it's not that hard to teach. It's just, it's hard for them to get information, um, all pretty concisely put together. And so the goal for the book was to do that. Um, so that, you know, our guests, when they walk into the bar already know what a Manhattan is and we can kind of work on riffs and do those two or 3.0 kind of cocktails and makes bartending more fun when your guests are educated and it, uh, it makes it more fun for them when they can actually interact with the bartender on another level. I, I, I always, <clears throat> those are always the sort of spots that I, that I loved and I still gravitate to because there is that, that appeal of connecting with, with the bartender and having that experience with another human being that really can only exist in that specific space. Um, and I, I wanted to ask you guys about this because you both alluded to the fact that, like you've left and come back and left and came back. And, you know, I, one thing that I wanted to ask you both about is this notion of kind of transitioning from being a bartender to being whatever it is that we do now. You know, I don't even really know what to tell people when I say that, you know, my what my connection to the spirits industry is these days because I have this podcast, I write about it, but I haven't bartended uh, consistently in about two and a half years. And I, I wanted to ask, you know, there is that. I don't that... think you were a consistent bartender before that. <laughs> I, was, I, I found myself behind bars consistently. Yeah, I was clocking consistently that. as a bartender. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, I forget to do that a lot too, but that's yeah. beside the point. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I wanted to ask about, you know, we, we're all, you know, every day we wake up a little bit slower and a little bit less hot, you know, we're all getting older. <laughs> and I wanted to ask about, you know, if you had any, any, experiences or wisdom you wanted to share about, you know, transitioning from that younger bartending phase to like more of sort of a, a, I don't know, I don't want to say mentor phase, but kind of like a, or or quite a wise old elder phase, but somewhere in the middle of that. (laughs) I think Jacob transitioned before I did. So do you want to talk a little bit about your, your progress out? I feel like I'm still, I'm still in that transition. I, I, I've, you know, I've, um, yeah, it's been quite a while since I attended bar full time. You know, I managed a few places early on, uh, living in Portland, um, but also pretty early on got pulled uh, to the brand side a little bit. Uh, the, the first brand job I had, you know, about ten years ago at this point, if not more, was uh, for Bolsey and Aver when they were were relaunching um, in the U.S. I should say. Uh, so yeah, I guess part of it is that I've I've never gone full time since I started bartending to a non-bar job. And I really like the fact that, you know, even if I am writing or working for a brand or doing something else, uh, I still have at least, you know, one foot in the game. Like I, I'm still actually pulling shifts, which, you know, I think gives you some credibility when when you write about these things or on the brand side, if you're you know, trying to convince someone to use your product or to know about your product, you know, the fact that you are actually out there making drinks for paying customers uh, night to night helps a lot. Um, you know, getting into why I think we both like the library is, as Brett said, it's, uh, a place that's, you know, very education focused or if not education, at least talking <laughs> like, um, I, I don't, I'm not the guy you want, uh, at a busy bar on a Friday night in the speed. Well, it's just not going to end well for anyone, but, uh, it's nice to be at a bar where it's really about just creating that customer experience with the customer and getting to talk to them, whether it's about the spirits or other things. Um, and so, yeah, I like, I like keep, keep coming back to that. And I don't know if you guys, you know, relate, but you know, when you talk about, you know, mentorship and stuff like that's literally my job now, like my job title is spirits curator and education manager. Um, and I teach classes for our team every week to make sure they're, you know, we're, we're all learning constantly, but I don't ever feel like I'm done. And so I don't ever feel like, uh, like I'm at a, level above somebody else you know it feels really really strange yeah. when people come to me for advice because i'm like i don't know i'm just a bartender like you and then i forget that they're 15 years younger than me um mm-hmm. or whatever and that they actually i do have some experience to to give them um it, it's a, a thing i i kind of forget all the time and it's maybe a good thing to 
not remember it too much too. <laughs> sure. Well, you don't want to yeah. ever get to the place where you, where you, you, I think people who are great teachers are people who are great learners and never want to stop learning. And that helps you yeah. keep teaching, right? You know, yeah, it keeps you excited. Uh, my dad told me all my life, you know, if you're the smartest guy in the room, you're in the wrong room. Um, which only means that if you've learned everything you can learn from this room, it's, it's time for you to, well, it means two things. It means it's time for you to, to move to a new room where you can keep on learning, or it means it's time for you to realize that you now have to do the teaching. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and what's been really fun for me at the library is realizing that, you know, when I was coming up there, I found a niche that I was, Hey, I'm going to really dive into this thing that maybe nobody else is doing here, which was Mezcal for me. And I became the expert on Mezcal and I'm seeing our team now find those niches and realizing that like, Hey, I can't be an expert on everything we have on the wall, but I can inspire someone else to like deep dive into cognac. And you can now be the person I talk to about cognac or somebody else can be the person I talk to about absinthe. And it's fun to realize you can start to teach, but really you're just inspiring them to learn and to know that there's, there's more out there that they can get into. And, and then eventually they're teaching you. Yeah. Th thousand percent. You know, I tell my team, you know, because, uh, you know, Multnomah has just an overwhelming sheer number of bottles. And, of course, at, at Mori Margo, I just have a, a, a number of uh, obscure, you know, unknown bottles to most, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. still yeah. a big number. Yeah. It's a big yeah. number of bottles. It's overwhelming. But I tell, there. tell the team, you know, uh, and, and I tell my teams at all my bars, not just at Amore, but, but specifically at Amore, it really resonates is, uh, you know, if you know one thing confidently about every single bottle on the back bar, you know more than every guest who comes in the room. If Absolutely. you know two things about every single bottle on the back bar, you know uh, more than most people who work in this business. If you know three things about every bottle on that back bar, you are expert level. That's it. Don't try and overwhelm yourself by knowing every single thing about every single bottle. Know three things about every bottle and you are expert. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, I also think it's just hard to in this industry to transition from bartending. There is not a lot of examples. You know, where it's still a pretty young like career, right? Like mm -hmm. people have been bartending forever, but I think the way that it's you know changed in the last two decades, where you can be a person who transitioned out of it, but is still in that in this world, is is pretty new. So I didn't even know where I was going to be going. I just knew I didn't want to you know close down the bar at two a.m. every single night for the rest of my life. Uh, and so it's been really cool just to find uh, an outlet for that. Not me, man. Uh, not me. I want to be. I want to be there till two every night. <laughs> <laughs> You're he's, better man he's than living, me. He's living his principles, guys. So does he. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, the the fun thing to me is it seems to run through this is like you know this this passion for. I mean, everybody. Nobody gets into this for the long run, whatever that means to them. Whether the long run is like two years or twenty, uh, if they don't like, a, you know, if they're not they might not be honest with themselves about it, but everybody kind of likes being up on that stage, right? Everybody likes the spotlight a little bit. That's why they do this whole bartending thing. And I think it seems to me like the transitioning of, you know, okay, you're, you have that light on you. What do you want to do with it is the path is the path to, you know, maybe moving from telling people about, you know, those one things, two things, three things, you know, about everything on the back bar at, 1 30 in the morning to maybe uh writing it down in a book say uh yeah. <laughs> for for practical use and information absolutely yeah i mean it's it's a pretty fun thing to be able to uh also do it you know for a larger audience you know i i worked on a in a, in a project in honolulu last year and it was i was behind the bar every night um and i was reminded very quickly that you maybe get one chance every night to like actually engage with somebody based on how busy it is or how, you know, engaged they are. A lot of times people sit at your bar and they're on a date and they're talking to each other and it's my job not to interrupt that. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And so it is very rare sometimes to be able to actually have a good time engaging with the guests at your bar. Um, and so when you write a book, you're doing that, you know, at their, at their pace. And it's really fun to be able to share what you know um, with people who are ready to learn. That's amazing. And speaking of being ready to learn, I want to learn about um, we we when we were talking before the show, Aquavit got brought up, and being anti shift drink got brought up, which I really want to get into. <laughs> but before we do that, we should take a quick break and hear from some of our sponsors. So stay tuned. We'll be right back with the Speakeasy here on Heritage Radio Network. If you're a loyal listener of the Speakeasy Podcast, you've definitely heard us talk about Diageo Bar Academy. 
Diageo Bar Academy is a totally free resource for bartenders, bar managers, and those in the hospitality industry. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing I love about DBA is that it's there for everybody. You know, whether you're an experienced bartender looking for inspirations or trends, or you're just starting out, there's online courses that offer real life skills to help you grow your career. Um, many of these take 30 minutes or less to complete. And my favorite part, our favorite part, it's always free. free. Uh, the quizzes and activities are free. The virtual bar is free. The e-learning courses covering a whole range of different topics are free. It's there for everyone, no matter your skill level, no matter your pay grade, no matter who you are. Yeah, so visit DiageoBarAcademy.com to build your skills with Diageo Bar Academy e-learning and master classes. Become a member today for instant access to the global bar community. Again, that's Diageo Bar Academy, D-I-A-G-E-O baracademy.com go get it and we are back you're listening to the speakeasy on heritage radio network in the studio today we've got uh brett adams and jacob greer uh and we're talking about their new book but i want to talk a little bit about um brett sorry i want to talk a little bit about why you might be um anti-shift drink you know i think the shift drink tradition is one that's uh near and dear to a lot of people um and i'm curious why you are against it uh, yeah, um, it was near and dear to me as well, uh, because I, f I really bought into the idea that, you know, everybody taking a drink after work uh, is about like community and bonding together. Um, but I've changed my mind on that, um, both in a longevity thing, you know, we're talking about how long we want to stay in the industry. And I've, you know, I'm 40 years old now, and I've been bartending for I've been in restaurants for 20 years. And I have seen that arc of a lot of people who engaged with this industry in a way that didn't allow them to stay in it. Um, and I've also just kind of like wanted to take, be a little healthier and interact with alcohol in a healthier way. And I realized that what we kind of see as this communal bonding of taking a shot after work every night, actually I think is unfortunately maybe not um, setting a good kind of path and example for people that like the way that we interact is all drinking together all the time. And I've worked with a lot of people who are sober and really, really struggling. And when they see everybody taking shots together, um, it's really, really challenging for them to feel like they're a part of the team. And I've worked at a few places that have banned shift drinks or, you know, they've just gotten rid of it. Uh, the whiskey library used to do it and we got rid of it and it's been incredibly healthy for people. Um, it allows people to, you know, if you want to go out after work and have drinks with your, your coworkers, that's awesome. Um, I love doing that. I, I, you know, I drink almost every day, but not having compulsory drinking being part of the profession has, I think been kind of amazing. And I, I just want to like, personally for me, any, in, place I'm going to be a part of in the future is not going to have shift drinks um, because I like the idea that we get to choose to drink rather than feeling like we're all compelled to drink. Sure. A little bit of a double-edged sword involved in it, right? You, mm -hmm. I think you're right. I've never considered the notion that maybe in my earlier days, I felt compelled to have that shift drink, but you're, you're probably right. I'm, I'm guessing I was like, well, I'm done with, with work, punch the clock. And that means I get a drink before I go. Um, yeah. It, I just want to like, yeah, I think there's a way to change how we think about drinking in this world, especially if we're going to be in it for, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. Yeah. Um, you know, at, at Amore, um, I got uh, the program that I put into place there because we had, you know, we were all experiencing new bottles. Um, I, in the beginning days, now the number's actually gone up because because we're bigger, but, but I get a hold of something new for the back bar and I reserve two bottles of it and I put it somewhere that the guest cannot see. Uh, and right next to it is uh, a notebook and we as a team, because we don't, you know, because it's such a small space, we're not always working together. We as a team sip on those two bottles until they're gone and we write in the Moleskine or whatever, our opinions, our, our, our tasting notes, et cetera, maybe what we might consider making a drink with it or things like that. Um, and it's a good way for us to like, then when I get the bottle in, I put it in the back bar so, so the guests can see it. We all have, again, we, we know those three things about that bottle. We have some ideas about what we might want to do with it when, when asked. Um, but that's not really a shift drink. That's just a way that I was like, well, let's educate ourselves. You know, like, let's do this kind of deep dive tasting. But I can I can see both sides of the coin for sure. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, I mean, we have class every Tuesday at 1130 in the morning where we, I put blind flights down or, we, you know, we teach the team about, about spirits. And so there's still going to be drinking involved in the job. And, you know, I put out spit cups and stuff and I spit as much as I possibly can. Um, so it's not that you shouldn't drink. It's that this idea that like every single day after work, 
we take a shot together or two or three. And then you're really starting to, you know, get kind of go down this path where people who maybe have, um, you know, issues with addiction are, you know, maybe being accidentally pushed in directions where we don't necessarily need to as a, as a bar, you know, what people do after work is on their own, on their own terms. But I feel like as a business, I don't want to, uh, be a negative influence on people. Um, and I want to, you know, do as much as I can to positively associate drinking with like a healthy lifestyle. Uh, and if I'm taking a shot after work every single night, you know, that's, that can kind of lead to negative places, unfortunately for some people. And, and what it does help that, you know, the bar that we work at is not the last place closed yeah. in the neighborhood. So, you know, we're not, we're not sending people home at the end of a long day with like yeah. nothing, you know, yeah. <laughs> they, they do have the option to go out and we get to support our neighbors and get to know our neighbors um, so, you know, our, our, our team does bond, we do socialize, you know, but it doesn't have to be every time. And so, and, and I, I've enjoyed that, you know, personally, when, when I work that, you know, I, I don't go out every night after work, but if I'm particularly feeling it, or if there's someone I really want to talk to, or it's somebody's birthday, uh, you know, we still, we still go out and we celebrate those. Yeah. Things. And the nice thing about that too, is that it then becomes an active choice, right? As opposed to just like a passive default setting that you go into, you know, it's like you have to, it, you, you pick yourself up off of your stool or even counting your money or whatever. And you have to actively think to yourself, do I want to, you know, power myself on my two human legs to another bar or am I done <laughs> for the night? As opposed to just, you know, right. you, you sit there and there's like the taps are right there and the bottles are right there. And you're just kind of like, well, I might as well. And I think that's a big thing that's been huge for me about um, trying to be more mindful of my drinking in my thirties is like thinking to myself when I go home and I'm like about to crack a beer or about to pour a whiskey or whatever is thinking to myself, like, do I really want this right now? Or am I just doing it because it's a default setting? Absolutely. Absolutely. I drink a lot of soda water now and that that helps me like half the time I want a beer. It's actually, I just want bubbles, you know? Mm -hmm. And Yeah, exactly. I, I'll drink soda water and then I'm like, oh, I actually don't know if I needed that beer, which is great because, you know, I get terrible hangovers. So if I can avoid <laughs> that extra beer, then I'm in a good place. Yeah. And relatedly, like I am so happy right now that there are like respectably good non-alcoholic craft beers yeah. coming out. Because, yeah. uh, you know, like I love beer. I'm not, I have no intention of giving up beer, but that does open up that possibility now to think like, do I want the alcohol and, or like I can save the drinking for like, if it's a social occasion where that feels good, or if it's just an amazing beer that you really can't replicate any other way versus I just want a decent beer while I cook dinner or while I go sit out on my roof deck and read a book in the sun. Uh, and it, I don't care if it act, actually has alcohol or not. And I might even prefer that it doesn't. So yeah, I, I love that. That's an option now. Okay. I was at Jacob's house the other day and we were trying non-alcoholic beers and I was like halfway through and I was like, Oh man, I drove here. I better calm down. And I was like, wait, no, I can, I can just chug <laughs> all of these. It doesn't matter. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, there's so many options now for NA uh, canned uh, RTDs, both beers and otherwise. Um, yeah, there's there's plenty of stuff to do, um, and I think that's it's great. It's great to have those options available. Um, I see in the notes here also, uh, and I want to, I want to, I want to. I'm just curious. It just says secret vodka in cocktails. What do you mean when you when you say secret vodka in cocktails, Brett? Um, that is a a thing I've been thinking a lot about. Um, is I think vodka rightfully got a bad rep back in 2008 when cocktails were really starting to to grow and become you know part of the thing that you could see get in every city in America. Um, vodka was sort of the enemy of good cocktails um, because people drank vodka to get away from flavor, and it was really really challenging for bartenders to teach people about you know gin or rum or bourbon cocktails that they're genuinely going to like if vodka is an option. And so there were a lot of like, quote unquote, pretentious bars that got rid of vodka and forced you to have a bee's knees instead or something That's like me. that. I, I yeah, exactly. And and I still think- don't, Still don't have it. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's a there's a really good argument for doing that. Um, but what I've realized is that we're not in that same place anymore. Um, and vodka isn't necessarily the enemy of cocktails. We have people coming in and ordering Negronis on their own volition um, and being a little more willing to try things. And so- now, when I look at vodka, I don't see it as the enemy to, to good cocktails. I see it as just another tool in my tool belt. 
And what I love about it is that it's flavorless, but it still has energy, right? It still has alcohol in it. And there's something that I don't hear talked a lot about, which is the importance of, I think, diluting flavor without diluting energy in a cocktail. And so what I've been doing a lot is when I have really intense flavors in a drink that are all lined up, but maybe kind of stepping on each other's toes a little bit, I'll add a half ounce of vodka to the cocktail um, and it creates space in the cocktail, but it doesn't create another flavor and it doesn't create dilution of intensity. And it allows those big, bold flavors to kind of shine a little with a little more clarity. And so I'll put that in the cocktail and then I just won't put it on the menu because if people see vodka on a menu, then they won't order the cocktail. Um, so I call it secret vodka. It sounds, you know. Wait a minute. Yeah. You're now saying we've gone to the place where if people see vodka on the menu, they don't order it. They The wrong people <laughs> order it. So if I have, you know, if I'm thinking of like, you know, a big flavor. If I have like St. George terroir and chartreuse and Amaro del Barista in a cocktail, those might all be stepping on each other's toes. And that's definitely not for a quote unquote vodka drinker. But if I throw a half ounce of vodka in a cocktail with big things like that, it might um, give each of those big flavors the opportunity to be tasted better. And this is what gin producers already know, right? Like most gin is a concentration off the still and they're going to add a neutral spirit to mellow it out. Um, That's how almost all gins, except for a few single shot gins are made. Um, And so if that works for gin companies, why can't it work for my cocktail? Right. I just I'm I'm impressed at the the circle that we've gone in. I remember yeah. quite clearly, you know, 15, 18 years ago when I worked at Rye, uh, which you know the name should give you some in, in, indication <laughs> of what's about to happen at the bar. It was a bakery, but but I had yeah, nailed it. Um, but I had uh, a drink on the menu, and the first spirit listed in that drink was vodka, and all I did was rinse the glass with it. But it got people, to buy, that, <laughs> got people to buy that drink. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, very, well, I, you know, very clean glass. I found, uh, <laughs> I found you have to be really careful with the vodka cocktails you put on the menu because a lot of times people are looking for vodka um, as a way as a way out, right? Like mm-hmm. they don't want crazy flavors. So if we have a vodka cocktail that has crazy flavors in it, it's going to get returned. And I'm not in the habit of trying to you know berate guests. So I just want to mm-hmm. make it easy for people. So if I'm going to put vodka on a menu, it's going to be because – it's because it's likely going to be a broadly enjoyable drink. And if I'm going to put vodka in a cocktail in a, what I would consider not a broadly enjoyable drink, I'll just probably keep it off the menu. Right. That's fascinating. I've never even considered uh, the phrase you used was, you know, sort of creating some space in between the, the maybe aggressive aggressors in, in a cocktail. Um, yeah. That's the, uh, I'm going to, I come from I come from music and I'm not I'm by no means like a music producer, but you know, I've like recorded records and watching people mix albums is fascinating because you know, you talk about placing drums in particular parts of the mix and making sure that, you know, these frequencies aren't overlapping in certain ways. And I actually use a lot of inspiration in mixing sound in the way that I mix cocktails. And it's about putting big intense things into um one space and making sure that they're not overlapping and not canceling each other out yeah that's that's another great way of thinking about it i'm going to ponder this <laughs> this is not going to There's... encourage me to put black vodka on any of my bars I say yeah that. i mean but i just want the bacardi it, people but... to start you know hounding you to buy gray goose pretty soon and right but it good. may <laughs> put a little dent in my armor at least <laughs> uh, i mean that's the thing people uh, because i don't have vodka at the bars people think i don't drink vodka i do uh I, I, i've mentioned it many times here on the show and in my book even um, I have a bottle of Smirnoff in my freezer at all times. I mm-hmm. like it as cold as possible, so I don't need to add any ice, which is just dilution, which I don't want to dilute vodka. It's already water with consequences. Um, <laughs> and, I want to, and for me, food is the mixer. You know, I want to have yeah. ice cold vodka and an oyster, ice cold vodka and some salt and vinegar potato chips, ice cold vodka and, I don't know, pate, you know, something salty or fatty. Uh, is what I want. And I want to have vodka in little tiny glasses that I drink rocket fuel, <laughs> and that's it. Yeah, that's exactly how we introduce the uh, the vodka chapter in our book, which I, I think for us is around, I don't know, seven or eight chapters in. And and we talked about how, like, if we wrote this book 15 years ago, vodka would have probably had to be the first chapter because that's what everybody starts with. Uh, and it's not anymore. But But we did talk about how, like, one, you need other flavors to play with. Like, if you're building your home bar from scratch and all you have is a bottle of vodka, there's not a whole lot you can do with it. Um, but also telling the people like you, you got to appreciate vodka and to do that, you've got to have it with food. You've got to have it cold. Like if you're not doing 
pickles and you know preserved fish and ice cold shots of vodka you're really missing out absolutely right, yeah. i think you ate a i might misquote who said it but i think you ate a, is the one who said uh in vodka cocktails uh it is a celebration of the mixer yeah i mean right. i love yeah. a 50 50 vodka martini i think it's super underrated because i like vermouth and mm-hmm. a vodka martini with a lot of vermouth in it allows me to taste a vermouth in a way that i wouldn't taste it if i was just drinking vermouth on the rocks uh, and it it also means I taste it in a way that's different if I was drinking a 50-50 gin martini. So there's plenty of usefulness for it. You just have to think about why you're drinking it kind of differently than how we used to, I think. Yeah. Well, let's talk about another spirit that I love, um, Akavit. I see it on your list of things you wanted to talk about today. So let's talk about Akavit a little bit. Yeah, that that's my personal <laughs> obsession. <laughs> uh, yeah, talking about building a home bar, like if... You know, this is a way that our book is in some ways uh, impersonal because we had to set aside our personal preferences. Because if you if you come to my home bar, uh, it's 40 bottles of Akavit, <laughs> <laughs> you know, all different. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's something I fell in love with uh, pretty early in my bartending career, you know, which mostly started, I did a little bit in DC, but mostly started in Portland. And, uh, you know, we were really fortunate here. We had House Spirits, which was one of the first, if not the first, distillery in the U.S. to start bringing back Aquavit and introducing it to people. Uh, and I instantly loved it. You know, I, I just thought it was a really cool spirit. I, I used it in some cocktail competitions that they were doing. It was always putting it on the menu. Um, and then, so at the time, it's kind of a funny story how this came about. There were, I think there were only three Aquavits that I knew of made in the U.S. There was Krogstad here in Portland, the age Krogstad, <laughs> also made in Portland, obviously. Uh, and then there, <laughs> there was one in, uh, in Chicago called um, North Shore. And so I, I always wanted to try this North Shore one. And I happened to be in Chicago and uh, I was actually at my friend's wedding, which happened to be in the Swedish neighborhood of Chicago. And there's a liquor store across the street. I went in, they had it. And so I just put a joke out on Twitter, which was, I have now collected every single American-made Aquavit. Like, this was some <laughs> amazing post. It was three bottles. <laughs> but but, but I, was, I was super excited at the time. And then literally within an hour, I'd been retweeted by someone named Gamla Oud. And I look at their account, and it's an Aquavit distillery in Minnesota that's making a dill Aquavit. Um, so I... I'm like, no, I had the complete collection for half an hour and now I don't. <laughs> so, so I ended up uh, emailing uh, Mike, who is his name, Mike McCarran, really cool guy who started this company in Minnesota. And I emailed him I'm like, hey, man, here's the deal. I really like Aquavit. I, I want to try them all, but I live in a control state in Oregon. I don't know when I'm going to be in Minnesota. Like, I hate asking people for free stuff, but like, is there any chance I could somehow get a bottle from you? And he was really cool about it, sent me a bottle, and I was blown away. I'm like, this is so cool. And, you know, the fun thing about it is, you know, talking, we talked about vodka just now, and like, you know, the difference between vodkas is, is pretty small. I, I always, I know, always claim the difference, the difference between any but, one know, and then the other is just advertising budget. Yeah, a lot of the time that's the case. But, you know, some are a little more interesting. But, you know, it's always a small range. And then gin, you know, broader range, lots of different gins. Aquavit is huge. Like the the things you can do with Aquavit and the different botanical profiles and whether you age it or not. Uh, it, it, it seemed to me like this is back in 2009 or so. I was like, oh, bars are doing this backwards. You've got 10 vodkas and maybe four gins and, if you're lucky, one Aquavit. And I was like, no, you should have one vodka and 10 Aquavits because these are all really cool. Um, so I started an event called Aquavit Week where I was just like, I'm going to get every Aquavit I can and make a cocktail with each one because they're all different profiles. And um, I did this for a few years until uh, our company used to be called Arcus, which is the, the one in Scandinavia that makes Linia and Alborg and some of the classic brands finally reached out to me. After I had tried reaching out to their PR company in the U.S. and they didn't understand what I was doing, <laughs> uh, but but then the the company in Scandinavia finally reached out and we're like, hey, we don't know why you're doing this, but we really like it. Um, if we gave you some money, can you make it bigger? <laughs> and I was like, yes, this is what I've been hoping for. But uh, yeah, long story short, I love Aquavit. Would uh, love to promote <laughs> it as much as I can, and I really want to write an Aquavit book, but 
even with an agent, we've yet to find a publisher who's willing to take a risk. <laughs> well, on I don't that. know. You had you had you had pretty good luck laying out a, an Aquavit thirst trap on social media for you know the, the yeah. Scandinavian liquor brands <laughs> out there. Just keep just keep doing it. You're clearly onto something right there. Right. Um, yeah, it's also funny. Like Brett talks about secret vodka. We we also had some secret Aquavit. <laughs> In that, um, so I worked for the company that makes Lenny and Alborg for a while and went down to LA with our rep there. And she took me to this bar, you know, somewhere, I think, I think it might've been in Venice. And she said, Hey, it's not on the menu, but I'm telling you, this is one of your best accounts. And the reason is they put, you know, half an ounce, three quarter ounce of, of Aquavit on the menu. But she said, the staff was just so tired of being asked what Aquavit is <laughs> that they just took it off the listing. So like it's in there, <laughs> it's contributing flavor, but, but they were, they were tired of talking about it. So, you yeah. know, secret Aquavit. I put Brennavin in too. a whiskey cocktail the other day and it was not at all for the flavor of Brennavin. It was just like, it added a savory note and it wouldn't have made the menu. It was just mm-hmm. a secret, yeah, secret Aquavit for sure. I mean, it's a, it's uh, Aquavit and, and whiskey, particularly, I think like Irish whiskey and, and, uh, Scotch whiskey is an amazing combination. Like something about like those, the, the multi notes of each of them, like really, really combine in a very interesting way that I'm all here for. Absolutely. I think, I mean, split based cocktails are, there's way more work to be done with combining spirits. You know, we, we, we combine Amaro and stuff and daiquiris, but the idea of adding, you know, whiskey and, and aquavit together or anything like that. There's so much more fun combinations out there. Mm-hmm. Do you mention aquavit at all in the book? Uh, we mention it, but we don't we don't call for it. I think actually I don't even know if we mention. I think we might like obscurely yeah. reference it. But <laughs> yeah, we had I had to put my uh, my own preferences in check, and we we cut the. I mean, the our original idea, idea was 52 bottles, and you're supposed to be like you buy a bottle a week, you know, and that that realized that was going to be a 600 page book. And so it's a <laughs> it's a twenty five bottle uh, bottle book, and I think that's a really great place to get people started. And if you understand the concept of gin, you know, it's not a big jump to understanding what Aquavit is, right? You're already you're just infusing a neutral spirit um, with a different flavor profile. So um, yeah, maybe second book we'll talk about that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, save it, save it for the Aquavit book, guys. Oh man, that's that's where we're really yeah. going to cash in. <laughs> you always got to leave them wanting more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, speaking right. of wanting more, if people wanted to get in touch with you or wanted to uh, follow what's you know the the release date of the book or what you guys are up to, where should they find you on the socials? Uh, I'm I'm on Instagram. I'm not on Twitter, but I'm I'm your daily Brett on Instagram with periods in between the words. Uh, Will any of us be on Twitter soon? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Twitter is <laughs> yeah, it's questionable. Taking a note yeah. And yeah, and I'm it's just my name at Jacob Greer, G R I E R on pretty much every platform. I try to keep it consistent. Um I also have a a blog and a Substack newsletter. Uh, also at jacobgreer.com or jacobgreer.substack.com. So <laughs> consistent branding <laughs> I, I've I've decided is the, yeah, the way to go. Makes makes it makes you easily found. Um well guys, really yeah. appreciate you stepping in and taking on the you know, uh, duty of being our guest on the show today with such short notice. I mean, I, I reached out to you was great. late yeah, afternoon yesterday. <laughs> um, and we're you know, really excited about the book coming out, which uh, again drops uh, within the next couple of weeks, correct? Yeah, and everywhere right you can now, buy books. Yeah, November, November yeah, 29th. Right now, you can already pre order it in a lot of places. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, highly recommend people get out there and get a hold of a copy. Um, yeah, raising yeah. the bar is the title. Yeah, we should, yeah, we should title, mention the yeah. title, raising the bar. If you're yeah, looking for and it, and it's a perfect Christmas gift. All that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, well, uh, it, it looks handsome as hell. I got to hold a copy yesterday for five seconds uh, while you guys were talking <laughs> about it, um, and I was like, "Man, we should have you on the show." Maybe January. Uh, and then I called you back. I <laughs> yeah. called you back like you know, right. ten minutes later. I was like, "Hey, uh, listen, January is tomorrow." Um, let's yeah. get this thing <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, and I will say that the design is something we can boast about because Brett and I had it, yeah. nothing to do with it. Uh, it was it was all the publisher and uh, Woody Harrington, the illustrator. Like we have, we have no no skills in that regard, but we are blown away by like how good the design looks, and we're really happy with the yeah. cover. So it's beautiful. Uh, yeah, we're thrilled. Yeah. Um, well, again, uh, it looked handsome, uh, and I I want to get a hold of a copy ASAP so I can read it and put it into my library. I'm building a library for my company. Uh, for all my uh, team and, and and even local bartenders to be able to come in and check out books uh, to to find inspiration, et cetera, to keep uh, to keep you know everybody moving forward. Awesome. Um, but 
can't thank you enough for jumping in and being on the show and uh, looking for. Are you going to do any touring for the book? Uh, we hope so. Yeah. If any, uh, you know, big liquor companies are listening right now, and want to <laughs> especially, <laughs> especially to the beat brands. Yeah. Below. yeah. Uh, we, yeah. we list quite a few brands <laughs> by name in the book. Uh, and so we're hoping to partner with them in the future. Well, let's talk about, I mean, I know we're going to wrap up the show, but let's talk about that for a second. Did you not, uh, cause I considered for my next book, did you not reach out to brands beforehand and say, Hey, I'm going to feature you in a book. If you, you know, maybe play a little, play a little ball with me. We didn't want it to be like, Messed, it, that felt too manipulative. So we got you know samples of product, um, mm -hmm. but there were there were no strings attached. There was no like payment or anything like that. It was just sure. hey, we're gonna sample this stuff, and then you know in chapters like a bourbon chapter, we're like hey, these are four bottles we think you should start with, mm -hmm. um, or rum or whatever else it was. So and then obviously there's literally a chapter called Campari, right? There's certain chapters that are literally brand names because that's just yeah. kind of what you do. But uh, we didn't. Um, do anything beforehand because that that felt disingenuous. Um, but now I'm I'm very happy to work with the brands that we highlighted because we think they're great. One thing, you know, just to, to clarify in our book too is because we were trying to to go for versatility, like none of none of the individual recipes call for say a specific yeah. bourbon or gin mm -hmm. or rye. Like the recipe just says bourbon, and then at, at the beginning of the chapter when we tell you what bourbon is and why you should buy a bottle. We also have a section that just says like five bottles mm -hmm. we reach sure. for, and it, it's not meant to be, you know, the end all be all of the of the bourbon shopping. It's just saying like, hey, here's here's five that we like and endorse. And yeah, it's meant, it's meant to be too. literally the first bottle you buy. Like right. we, I work in a bar with seven hundred bottles of whiskey. Like I like a lot of whiskey, but uh, the first bottle you buy should be maybe one of these. Got it. Your first pour. Well, exactly, guys. Once again, really great having you in the studio with us. Um, so uh, everybody rush right out and order your copy of Raising the Bar, a bottle-by-bottle -bottle guide to mixing masterful cocktails at home um, by Jacob Greer and Brett Adams uh, from right out here in Portland. Um, and can't thank you enough for being on the show. So that's it for this week's episode of The Speakeasy, everybody. Tune in to Heritage Radio Network for plenty more shows just like this one. Uh, and uh, click on the beating heart to donate uh, to keep shows like this and others on the air. Uh, and uh, uh, cheers, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> it's a late one. Score. <laughs> Score. <laughs> <Skull. laughs> so you don't shun the devil with your rock. The Speakeasy is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network. Food and drink radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe. Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like, Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like, it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next farm bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to The Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network, wherever you listen to podcasts.